Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Ilica PLC's investor presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and, and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your question and press send, uh, and that will be present on the uh, company's dashboard. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Um, these will be available Available via your Investor Meet company dashboard, and we will send you an email to notify you when they're ready for you guys to, to review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, and if you could give that your attention, that would be very, very helpful um, for, for the company. Thank you very much indeed. And I'd now like to hand over to Graham Purdy, CEO, and Steve Boydell, CFO of Illico. Good afternoon to you both. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon to everyone. Many thanks for joining us for our half-year results update. Uh, we're speaking to you live from Ilica's headquarters in Romsey on the sunny English Riviera. So we're going to speak to you over the next 20 minutes or so about Ilica's solid-state battery technology. Um, and for the avoidance of doubt, we are one of the few independent global experts in this particular field. Um, we were aim listed back in 2010 and we have two parts to the business. We have our Stereax miniature solid state batteries uh, and then we have our large format Goliath uh, batteries that we're developing with partners from the automotive industry supported by the UK's uh, Faraday battery challenge. So apologies for those of you who have been following the company for quite some time. Um, I'm going to go over some of the fundamentals as we go through the slide deck. Uh, but uh, for those of you who are experts already in our technology, feel free to submit questions into the Q&A. Uh, and Steve and I will do our best to answer those questions in as much detail as we can. So the markets that we're addressing are truly huge. First of all, uh, medtech and industrial sensors are the markets that are particularly suitable for our miniature uh, micro batteries, for our Stereac cells, whereas our Goliath cells are designed for consumer electronics or perhaps more broadly domestic appliances, such as the handheld vacuum that you see in the picture there. Uh, as well as ultimately EVs. So why are people interested in solid state batteries? Well, first of all, they are ultra compact. So my rule of thumb is that they occupy about half the volume of a traditional lithium ion cell. And this is particularly interesting for uh, our millimeter scale medical implants for Stereax. But of course, it's also useful for EVs by the time you get to that scale uh, because of the design opportunities it opens up and of course the weight saving uh, that it implies. They're high temperature and that they operate at up to 150 degrees C and this really opens up some of those industrial markets where you can't use a traditional lithium ion cell. And they're also fast charging. We actually see uh, charge rates of up to 25C for our miniature thin film Stereax batteries. I don't think we'll get quite that fast charging rates out of our large form format uh, Goliath cells, but our rule of thumb is that we can expect six times faster charging uh, relative to traditional lithium ion. Of course, that's really exciting both for domestic appliances uh, where actually you need to, to recharge those devices when you need them, and also for EVs where you could have a recharging experience much closer to the one that we have when we pull up with our ICE powered cars uh, on a forecourt. So how do we make money out of this? Well, this is the, the business model for our, our Stereax thin film batteries. Um, we are currently a, a battery manufacturing company. In fact, we have a, a pilot line uh, here in Southampton in the UK um, where we produce a, a modest number of batteries per year. In fact, this technology 
uh, uses a, a wafer-based technology for depositing uh, the batteries. So we, we talk about wafer production. Um, we actually use a, a six-inch format for that. Um, we actually outsource the dicing and thinning of those wafers uh, to minimize the amount of substrate uh, that we uh, have to include in the battery packaging. We then do our own stacking uh, to, to amplify the capacity of the devices. And we do our own battery forming and testing prior to dispatching the cells to customers who've given us a PO. And it's an exciting time for Ilica because we're scaling up that manufacturing capability uh, where we operate our own wafer fabrication line. Um, we're, I'll come back to that later, but we're in the middle uh, of implementing this uh, strategy this year. Uh, we will continue to outsource dicing and thinning to third-party companies, uh, and probably also the stacking as well, uh, whereas we will continue to do the forming and the testing of the batteries before dispatch to customers. The next uh, stage up, the next scale up for us will be into a licensing model when we've stabilized the manufacturing workflow that we've got for Stereax. We'll be in a position to license that technology through to uh, some of the larger uh, wafer manufacturers, perhaps in the low cost production environments of Asia. Um, and, and we'll be able to transfer that technology as a package so that those organizations uh, will manufacture under license. So um, why now? Well, our pilot line usage for our Stereax products has been uh, ramping up remorselessly. What you see here is a plot of the allocation of our pilot line for product sales, which is in dark blue, uh, relative to uh, research and development, so improvement of our products, which is in green. And of course, it's great news, actually, that demand is ramping like this. Um, uh, unfortunately, of course, that's squeezing out some of the R&D activities that we need to continue to execute in order to make sure that our product remains cutting edge. And so uh, it's time for us to uh, use this as a springboard to move into manufacturing on a larger scale. And by the end of this calendar year, we expect to have a 70-fold increase in the manufacturing capacity that we have at our disposal. So what are the areas, what are the, the industries that are wanting to buy uh, these uh, Stereax miniature batteries from us? Well, uh, actually, they, they split into these two categories. So um, on the one hand, industrial IoT. So these are really uh, wireless uh, sensors for, uh, for measuring data in different environments, often hostile environments. This is, first of all, wafer sensing. So, you know, the whole electronics industry uses uh, wafers for making new products like new, you know, um, silicon chips uh, and other components. And these products are, um, are deposited in vacuum chambers, vacuum deposition chambers that need to be calibrated to run at exactly the right temperature to optimize the process. Um, if they are run at the wrong temperature, then you get reductions in yield. So having the right process conditions can have a very significant economic impact. And of course, it's really quite difficult to, to run cables onto a wafer. Actually, it's much better if you can measure the temperature directly on wafer. And so these thin miniature batteries are, are really perfect for uh, being able to power the sensors inside the chambers. Other condition monitoring examples include other, you know, industrial hostile environments like wind turbines. Uh, we, we've already had a successful field trial, which we uh, we, we communicated last year. Um, process equipment like chemical plants, power stations, refineries, oil and gas facilities, where often you have, you know, elevated temperatures that batteries need to deal with. Um, and then infrastructure, you know, the, the Western world has got a lot of infrastructure that's starting to age and needs to be monitored. Things like 
railway tracks and, and bridges, etc. And then on um, the, the medical side, the, there is an entire revolution that is engulfing um, the, the medical device industry, which is all about turning devices into smart devices. So historically, a lot of implants have been mechanical devices, but actually there's an increasing demand uh, for them to transmit data about how effective uh, they are operating. So one example is orthopedics. You know, there's a huge number of hip replacements and knee replacements around the world. Uh, and often the success of those replacements is driven by um, the physiotherapy that happens after the surgical procedure. So are the patients being active enough? Are they doing their exercises? And by putting in a, a smart sensor into these implants, you can get a lot of information, particularly during those critical you know, first few months uh, after uh, discharge from hospital hospital to make sure that the, the patients are, are getting the most out of those implants. Then nerve stimulation, you know, this is the great hope really of the healthcare industry that we can start to replace chemical-based pharmaceuticals uh, with um, electroceuticals or bioelectronics, um, you know, to, to deal with some of the world's biggest disease problems. Um, so diseases that are pretty diverse, ranging from arthritis uh, through to diabetes. Then sensors, so measuring things like, you know, glucose concentration in the blood and, and also, um, you know, blood pressure. And then ophthalmic applications uh, where you need miniature batteries to deal with eye conditions. So this is what the, you know, the, the numbers of the scale up look like. We're able to produce currently on our pilot line about 1500 devices a year. Um, you know, we're, we're looking for that 70-fold increase as we move towards the end of this calendar year through the fab that we're building here in the UK and then beyond that uh, into the mass markets with large-scale licensed production. So here's a bit of detail about our fab implementation timetable. Um, you know, the, the major tools that we're installing uh, are the enigmatically titled Tool 1 and Tool 2, which are basically the key deposition equipment that we're using in order to make these batteries. Tool 1 uh, is coming from California in the US. Actually, I was just on the phone to the, the fabricators on Tuesday evening. That's making great progress. Uh, and then Tool 2 is coming from Switzerland. Uh, they are both about to uh, have the, the factory acceptance tests uh, in the next month or so, which is where we test the basic functionality of those tools. They'll then be delivered for installation by the time that we have completed our fab site preparation, which is an activity that we'll be doing over the next three months. We're about to conclude the lease negotiations for a facility and build our clean room inside of that facility, so like a, a building inside a building. Um, we'll then hook up that equipment and uh, commission it. And in quarter four of this calendar year, we'll start a product qualification, which will take us through into 2022, uh, so that we'll be ready for product sales uh, in the course of calendar year 22. So there you go, there's a summary of those activities. Uh, we've also crucially appointed a new technology transfer director, uh, Paul Moron, who joined us uh, with uh, a great track record in the aerospace and uh, semiconductor industry uh, back in September. And he's now running the team for the implementation uh, of that process and spearheading the tendering for that outfitting contract of the clean room. So let's change gear a little bit, literally, and, and talk about Goliath, our large format batteries. Um, we've currently got three programs that we're running with UK automotive partners. Uh, first one being Power Drive Line. Uh, that's with Honda and Ricardo, and that's focused on the rapid charging of vehicles. Then we've got a program that's being led by McLaren, which is called Moses, 
uh, and that's all about using solid state cells in performance vehicles. And that's actually uh, also including A123 Systems, which is a, a US headquartered Chinese owned uh, battery company. Um, and, um, you know, the, the performance vehicle market is really important for us because I see that as, you know, the, the leading edge of automotive deployments. And uh, I expect that when we first get to market in automotive, it'll be through the types of vehicles that companies like McLaren and their competitors uh, design and, and commercialize. Um, and then Granite is the third program uh, that's also supported by uh, the Faraday Battery Challenge uh, via Innovate UK. Um, and that's being led by Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, and that's all about making sure that the technology for solid state manufacturing is as compatible as possible with existing uh, lithium ion cell production. Because for rapid adoption and for moving down the cost curve as quickly as possible, it's really important that actually we reduce the barriers for adoption given the large amount of capital that's being invested in traditional lithium ion battery manufacturing processes. And then at the bottom there, we've got a box called the, the Lead Partner Framework. And this is really to allow companies who operate outside of the remit of uh, the Faraday Battery Challenge to engage with us on a commercial basis to talk about developing cells for their applications. And, and in particular, this is useful for engaging with cells for consumer electronics um, and also domestic appliance manufacturers who you know, will have a different format for the cells that they want to use. Um, but this is a really important sector for us. And, and I actually think that we will get to market with our technology in uh, domestic appliances before we get to market in automotive simply because you know the the number of cells that you need in order to address a market launch opportunity in domestic appliances is less uh, the price point that you have to reach isn't quite as low uh, and also the degree of testing or, or rather more strictly uh, the the volume of testing that you need isn't quite as demanding in uh, domestic appliances as it is for automotive. And, you know, the reason why solid state is of such interest for EVs is, um, you know, most countries have got targets that their industry bodies set for what uh, battery packs have to deliver the UK is no exception. It has uh, the UK Auto Council, which is a, a group that advises government policy. There are targets for 2025 that have been set. And actually, you need solid state in order to meet those targets. It's just not possible for standard lithium ion cells uh, to meet those industry expectations. So we've secured just over five million pounds of uh, funding from the, the Faraday Battery Challenge which is supporting those three projects that we were looking at before. And we've also used that funding to outfit a, and open what we call our pre-pilot facility, uh, which we did last year. And uh, you know that was opened in September 2019. We had our Capital Markets Day. Some of you may have attended that uh, at the end of, uh, of 2019. And uh, actually, frankly, you wouldn't really recognize the facility <laughs> relative to the pristine condition that it was in then because we, we've used it pretty intensively. You know, we make prototypes at a rate of about a kilowatt hour a week. You see um, some of the uh, the substrates on the left-hand side and that rack there and, and some of the cells ready for processing at the top. And, and a typical pouch cell that we produce being held up by one of our engineers and we you know we've shared those samples with the automotive partners that have just been listing in previous slides uh, and um, you know we've, we've demonstrated significant improvements in the capacity and, and cycle life and, and also power density of those cells over the course of the last year um, you know there's still further development that's needed and actually at, at this point I should emphasize uh, a couple of things first of all 
we use a different process for making these pouch cells than we use for making our Steriac cells. So the Steriac cells are made using uh, a vacuum deposition process. And, and that process is great for making miniature batteries, but actually it's totally uneconomic for making large format pouch cells. So we switched to uh, a printing process and actually you can see uh, one of our uh, small scale printing stations in the background in that image on the left hand side and that allows us to make cells of the format that's being shown there uh, in a cost effective manner. So it's a, a screen printing process that we use for depositing the materials in bulk. Um, and um, the uh, that that's allowed us to uh, to make uh, a significant volume of cells uh, for testing. Um, the uh, the difference in technology maturity though is also important to understand. So our um, our thin film Steriac cells are at a, a technology readiness level that's about a TRL of seven. And I, I use this scale. This is a scale that that NASA came up with back when they were making the, the space shuttle um, because actually they wanted to, to be able to evaluate how mature and robust the technologies that they were being offered really were. And, um, and so they've got the scale that goes from, you know, TRL 1 through to TRL 9. Uh, TRL 1 is, is really, you know, a, a sort of academic breakthrough in a university lab. And TRL 9 is the opposite end of the scale where it's a commodity that you can order over the internet and it arrives the next day. Um, TRL uh, for Steriax is at about a seven. And, and what that means is that we make it reproducibly on our pilot line and it's been used in uh, evaluation devices. So field trials, like for instance, the wind turbine trial that we did with that device. And when we get into you know the, the manufactured uh, line that so the, the 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 UK fab that I was talking about earlier will move into a TRL of eight. Where we are with these pouch cells is that we're at a, a TRL of about three, which means that you know we've we've got proof of concept. Uh, we're making these cells uh, on a, a line, but actually we're improving the performance of these cells so that they are acceptable for the application. And once we've put them into uh, a battery module and a, a pack and, and tested that under automotive duty conditions, then we move into TRL4. So consumer electronics, just to emphasize, you know, cordless roadmaps for new products are really driving battery adoption here. These are things like you know, handheld vacuum cleaners. We've probably all got a battery powered vacuum cleaner. But also beauty products, uh, big demand, you know, for things like hair straighteners and hair dryers and, and hair curlers and things. Uh, the compact nature of solid state is, is really attractive there. The fact you can charge these packs rapidly and that uh, they've got a, a long cycle life. So what does the manufacturing scale up route look like for Goliath? Um, we're currently in this pre-pilot facility. I talked about the one kilowatt hour a week. We'll probably, you know, increase the capacity of this existing footprint that we've got here to about 10 kilowatt hours a week over the next uh, couple of years, the next 18 months. And that will allow us to, to produce more pouch cells for evaluation. But what we announced back in September of 2020 was that we would scale up into a facility that would give us about five megawatt hours per week. Um, ideally with the UK BIC, which is the Battery Industrialization Center, which is based in uh, Coventry uh, here in the UK. And that will actually allow us to support our first commercial launch. So that's the attraction of going for something like domestic appliances. You know, we can make enough batteries in that facility to be able to support a uh, product launch. And then by the, we'll probably be able to support one or two performance uh, cars, performance vehicles from that facility. But then by the time we need to support mass market vehicle adoption, well then you need to get to gigafactory scale. And rather than build our own gigafactory, which is quite capital intensive, you know, my rule of thumb is that you need about 
750 million US to build uh, one gigawatt hour a year. Um, we will partner with an existing uh, cell manufacturing company and probably an OEM, much in the same way that here in, in the UK, you know, the, uh, the Sunderland facility was built as a JV uh, between Nissan and AESC back in the day, uh, now of course owned by Envision. So uh, we're not going to try and do that ourselves. We will uh, make a contribution of this technology uh, as an equity in kind uh, contribution towards the JV. So there's a, a picture of uh, one of the engineers at uh, the BIC having a look at our, our pouch cell format uh, in front of one of the big drying lines that's already installed in that facility. The UK BIC is, uh, you know, a, a publicly funded facility. It, it cost about 135 million pounds to build uh, and uh, is an open access facility for UK industry to be able to run uh, production lines initially in, in phase one of traditional lithium ion cells, but in phase two that will be extended to solid state. Uh, and uh, as the UK, if not Europe's leading solid state cell developer, you know, we'll be working hand in hand with that facility for that commercial rollout that I was talking about. Right, well, these are our half year results. So at this stage, uh, I'm going to let Steve Boydell, our FD, talk you through the numbers in the next couple of slides. Thank you, Graham. So we released our half year report this morning. Uh, this is a summary distillation of that. Uh, they're exactly in line with the uh, trading update that we, we gave on the 11th of November. Uh, so turnover for the, the six month period was 1.3 million relative to uh, 1.5 million last year. So clearly a slight shortfall there. And that's down to the government mandated shutdown of research facilities at universities, which is where our pilot line is currently housed in the University of Southampton. So that was shut for three months uh, and that's obviously had a, an impact on our ability to uh, service the orders that we have. Uh, we've kept tight control of our, our costs such that our EBITDA loss for the period uh, remains steady at 1 million. Uh, and clearly, we, we've got an increase in cash and balance at the year end relative to last year due to the 14.2 uh, million net equity raise that we did back in uh, April. On the next slide, we just show the use of our funds in, uh, in that, the six month period, um, starting with just under 15 million. Uh, the capex there is is for the um, initial deposits for some of the key equipment that we were showing earlier. So the deposits on the, those key equipment uh, for manufacturing, plus a little bit uh, associated with the Goliath programs, uh, working on cash outflow very much in line with our EBITDA and a, and a small working capital movement, showing us left as 12.4 million on the balance sheet at the end of October. Back to Graham. Thanks, Steve. So, just to wrap up, uh, our focus is on the commercial scale up of our Stereax miniature batteries through the implementation of that fab that I was describing. Um, and in parallel, we'll be maturing our Goliath technology, working together with those automotive partners uh, through you know, well defined programs supported by the Faraday Battery Challenge. And of course, they will allow us to pursue significant revenue growth opportunities in the coming years. Many thanks for listening to our presentation this afternoon. So I think we're going to move over to Q&A shortly. That's definitely. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Graham. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a copy of the recording, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investment Company dashboard, and we'll send you an email to notify you when that is ready. And I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. And if you could uh, allocate just a small uh, bit of time to do that, that would be very, very beneficial and helpful uh, to the company. Um, 
just Graham, obviously we've got over a hundred investors on today's call. Um, and obviously you've had significant questions coming through in the Q and A tab. We did receive uh, a number of questions that were pre-submitted by investors, which I know you very kindly uh, in anticipation of these numbers provided some written responses, which we will um, obviously make uh, available when we publish the responses. But perhaps I could ask you to just go on to the Q and A tab on the, on the right hand side of your screen as well. And perhaps if I could ask you to read out the question, perhaps who it's from um, and where appropriate to to give a response and we'll we'll manage the next 20 or so minutes um, um, in that manner if that's okay with you very good um, well I'm happy to take it from the top actually um, should we do that mark yeah that'd be brilliant thank you very much indeed let's have a look let's see who was first out of the blocks here I think that's uh, our um, our friend John, he said, can you please outline what IP you have in solid state batteries? Yeah, so that, that's a key question. You know, we, there's quite a lot actually in the public domain now. Um, there are, you know, probably 12 core patent families which have resulted in 25 granted patents around the world. You know, we typically focus on the key jurisdictions in Europe, uh, North America, and Asia and um, the, the reason I talk about patent families is because you know you make an application that turns into a PCT and then you engage with the uh, the national officers and um, those uh, patent examiners normally ask you to adjust your claims so you end up with slightly different patents from the original application in the different jurisdictions. Um, so, you know, you get a different uh, patent in the US by the US PTO that you might get in Europe through the EPO. Um, and uh, the patents generally cover um, materials. So that the materials that we put into, actually generally the electrolyte, because we tend to use commonly available cathode materials. Um, then the, the processes that we use to deposit uh, the materials, um, and you've heard that we use both vacuum deposition uh, approaches for Steriax, uh, as well as ink deposition approaches for Goliath. And then thirdly, you know, battery architecture um, and there's also quite a bit of know-how actually that we keep as trade secrets. So, you know, we choose like many companies not to put everything into our patents um, because there are some things actually that it, it, it's quite difficult to patent in particular, you know, process conditions because uh, you can't really police those anyway um, because they always happen behind chain link fences. So, you know, you, you keep some of that know-how back as trade secrets. So I hope that answers that question. Um, then we've got a question from Simon. It says, is a US listing in the pipeline to attract further interest and investment? What do you think, Steve? Do you want to answer that one? Yeah. Um, we currently don't have any plans to, to list in the US. Um, we, do, we are attracting US retail customers um, onto our register, and we're then getting it through uh, an over-the-counter pink sheets uh, product so basically the shares are being traded in the US um, as I say on, on an over-the-counter product uh, with the ticker ILIKF um, I mean that's an unregulated platform and we, and we do recommend that people buy the shares uh, from our London listing on AIM which is under the ticker IKA um, but as I say we have had a lot of US retail interest recently particularly at the Christmas period um, and they, they now account for about 12% uh, of our shareholder register. So it's clearly a key area for us to, to monitor closely. Very good. So uh, our next question is, uh, pouch cell manufacturing is scheduled in the UK BIC phase two. When do you, um, sorry, this just moved in front of me while I was trying to answer that. When do you envisage actually being in the BIC? So, um, yeah, the, the plan is actually that we get up to five megawatt hours uh, per week manufacturing capacity by 2024. Uh, so that will involve investing in equipment to be installed uh, in the UK BIC in advance to that. 
uh, you know, in line with, with that uh, timing. And we've got another question from Paul. He says, uh, QS, I guess that's quantum scape and solid power have recently published performance data for their batteries. Um, can you share similar energy density uh, and have you tested multi-layer Goliath cells? So um, actually our, our batteries have been uh, shared with uh, automotive development partners uh, in those Faraday battery challenge collaborations. Um, you know, frankly, the performance data for our cells is still at a, a fairly uh, early stage, similar actually to the stage that, that Quantum Scape are at. Uh, a lot of their data actually didn't, um, you know, result from what I'd say were full cells, but in fact is, is half cell data. Um, so, um, you know, we, we are in due course in the course of 20. 21 likely to share some of our full cell data that will allow a comparison on that basis. And, you know, we are focused on single layer Goliath cells at the minute. Uh, we, we are not yet making multi-layer Goliath cells in the way that solid power uh, have shown with their selected chemistry. Um, right, let's have a look. Next one. Uh, have the new rules of uh, origin around UK and EU exports had an impact on your forward-looking volume expectations? So we'll let Steve answer that one. Uh, a lot of our uh, evaluation samples are actually being shipped to the US uh, currently, so they're, they're falling outside these new rules of origin. Um, so we are monitoring uh, the impact of these things closely, but uh, as I say, currently it's not impacting us because uh, a lot of, particularly the medical device companies that are trialing our batteries are, uh, are US based. Very good. Now we've got a question from SS. Uh, how do you differentiate ILICA solid state technology from quantum scapes? Yeah, so actually, you know, the, some of the differences in our technology revolve around the materials choices and the chemistry as well as the device architecture. Um, what we've got in common is that both of us are using oxide-based electrolytes, um, although QuantumScape haven't really talked uh, very much about uh, what the nature uh, or composition of their electrolyte is. Um, so they use uh, a, uh, an approach that's commonly referred to as lithium-free in the cell industry and what that means is that actually they make a structure that hasn't got an anode when you initially make it and then when you charge the cell uh, the lithium plates out uh, between the electrolyte and the current collector uh, and creates uh, a pure lithium metal anode in fact, uh, our approach is that we use a, a silicon anode, you know, the layer of, um, of silicon that you need is actually much thinner than the layer uh, of cathode that you would use in these cells. And uh, we find that the capacity of silicon is, uh, you know, uh, easily enough to accommodate the amount of lithium that you push across the cell when you charge it. Uh, we, we've used this approach because we've successfully used silicon in our Stereax thin film batteries. Uh, in fact, in the early days uh, when we were prototyping those Stereax cells, um, we did uh, test a, a lithium-free or a, an anodeless uh, method because a, a lot of the early solid state cells that were prototyped in the national labs in the US used that approach but we found that the uh, the mechanical strain from that approach uh, led to delamination of the cells over time and, and a reduced cycle life so that's why we favor using silicon um, silicon has been you know successfully used by other competitors uh, in the industry you know for instance um, you know the, the work that Amprius is doing using silicon anodes um, 
Let's have a look. Next one from Nick T. It says, are there any potential shortages in key commodities used in production that might constrain expansion? Yeah, so that's a good question. And actually, we've spent a lot of time making sure that we don't use anything too exotic um, in our materials. In fact, as part of that uh, granite program that I was talking about earlier that we're doing with JLR, uh, we've we've had a specific work stream that's been looking at uh, ensuring we avoid any scarce materials, any scarce commodities um, that would make the the batteries uh, unaffordable, or would you know create shortages that would um, uh, put a break on the mass adoption of our cells. So that's a, an important uh, aspect that we're taking into account. Um, What's the next one? Next one's from Paul R. He says, given the recent announcements by EV OEMs, so Toyota and, and NIO uh, and GM, uh, about solid state batteries, clearly speed to market is important. Uh, what can management do to accelerate Goliath plans? Well, um, you know, actually, I, I think we're a pretty agile group here. I think, um, you know, our, our state of maturity and readiness is globally competitive um, and uh, you know we are expecting further resources to be made available um, by the, the Faraday battery challenge um, channel in the coming period and you know as a, a company we're continuously reviewing what collaborations we can enter into what expertise actually we can acquire from around the world to accelerate our programs, you know, we, we realize we haven't got the monopoly on brains and that there are some, you know, really exciting groups that are offering to work with us. And, you know, that could really inject some pace into uh, our program. So Brian says uh, you use a, a silicon anode, whereas uh, a lot of other companies using lithium anodes. Are there benefits to the use of silicon? Yeah, so I, I think that's, that's not dissimilar to um, you know the previous question on differentiation. You know, silicon has a massive capacity uh, for absorbing lithium, and we're working with uh, some of the global suppliers of uh, of silicon. Um, and you know, we're we're seeing some some great performance from using the right amount of of silicon in our cells. And and we believe that actually using a structured anode as opposed to plating out lithium metal. Um, gives you a better control over the stackability, if that's a real word, of, uh, of these uh, cells so that when it comes to increasing the capacity of the overall devices to make them you know, big enough uh, to go into EVs, that actually having a, a structured anode gives us uh, a, a benefit in that regard. Um, so let's have a look from phil h the next question is the ev battery market is projected to be worth 84 billion in 2025 via both your own manufacturing and also via licensing um what percentage of this market uh, is a liquor going after well actually we take a, a bottom-up approach to our forecasting so um what we tend to do is say you know who are the partners that we're going to engage with What's the offtake that we can expect those partners uh, to, um, you know, to to uh, to buy from us, and um, you know, what's the the volume of uh, cells that we can realistically manufacture? It's actually a very small percentage <laughs> of that overall uh, market value, even by the end of the decade. Uh, you know, we're selling into a very rapidly growing market. Uh, and, and we take a lot of comfort from that. Uh, we're certainly not constrained by market size. And, you know, I actually believe that uh, just about uh, all of the, um, the viable uh, solid state battery uh, offerings that are out there will enjoy a, a significant uh, percentage uh, of, uh, of the market. And in due course, I think, you know, solid state will take over from the market that uh, is is currently defined by traditional lithium-ion cells 
um, and, and own that market in the same way that lithium ion uh, has taken over from you know some of the traditional battery chemistries like nickel metal hydride and, and NICAD batteries. So I think it's a really exciting time uh, for solid state and, and we're going to see uh, you know some very large scale adoptions of the technology. I'm just going to scroll down a bit. So yeah, Steve's going to answer the next one. one. So a question from Paddy K. Uh, what are your views on the recent share price volatility? As you scale up your manufacturing, do you expect to see the share price reach a more solid state? Um, so clearly, yeah, there has been some volatility in our share price over the sort of Christmas period. Um, it's worth going back to um, earlier in last year when we did our fundraise at 40p. Um, once that was completed, the share price gravitated to around a pound, where it was effectively capped. Uh, and that was because we had a number of our institutional investors who'd been uh, invested for a while in Ilica, who'd invested through enterprise incentive schemes and uh, venture capital trusts, which meant that uh, once they'd held the shares for over three years, there were some significant gains that they could realize uh, through the sale of those shares. And effectively, they were selling those shares into, into the demand, and there was a, effectively a cap on the price at, at a pound. Um, you have seen some um, TR1s being released where they notified the market of their, of their shareholdings, such that uh, those shares were effectively uh, all cleared in the market just before Christmas. So effectively, the, the large sellers in the market um, were satisfied. Uh, and then that was coupled with the, um, the quantum scapes announcement and the interest in quantum scape. Uh, where investors, particularly in the US, were looking for um, other companies operating in the solid state battery space. And uh, Ilica has been one of the few publicly traded companies there and um, benefited from a lot of US retail uh, excitement, hence the, uh, the recent volatility. Um, I think we expect that volatility to, uh, to calm down, but um, there's no way of saying whether that. That means a more stable share price. It just uh, hopefully means that uh, we've still got that strong support from both the, uh, the UK and the US that we currently have. Thanks, Steve. So next one from Edward H. Um, are you the market leader in small batteries like Steriax? And you know, I would say that actually um, the uh, competition, the global competition for miniature batteries. Uh, like Steriax is far less intense uh, than the competition uh, for the development of large format pouch cells. So I would say that you know we are viewed as being uh, one of the the key parties in that market. Next from from Harish H. Uh, would you consider? Sorry, who do you consider to be your main competitor in the market, and and how do you compare to them? At this present time well you know i think it is true to say that for the goliath uh, solid state uh, batteries that there are a lot of people uh, actively working on this and and sometimes it's a bit tricky to be uh, absolutely categorically sure about the state of development uh, by different organizations so you know all of the big battery OEMs have got solid state programs, but they play their cards pretty close to their chest. So it's not always possible to say the state of development at companies like Samsung and, and Panasonic, LG Chem, uh, Cattle, because actually a lot of that data isn't really published. They don't really have a need to publish that. Um, the the, um, the technology development companies like Ilica are, are sometimes a bit more forthcoming. So, you know, we, we get more insight into what's going on at Solid Power and uh, Quantum Scape uh, uh, and uh, to some extent Prologium. So, um, you know, we were able to monitor progress there. And uh, I'd say, you know, that there isn't one particular main competitor. I, I think it's a very dynamic market. And uh, I think also it demonstrates how attractive the market is, that it is such a, a vibrant landscape. So next one from Brian E. Um, Toyota is expected to be the first to launch an EV with solid state batteries. 
um, does Ilica still have links with Toyota and any o overlap with co-owned patents? Yeah, so, um, you know, the answer to that is that, yeah, we, we still have jointly held um, patents, often covering some of the, the fundamental materials that are used uh, in electrolytes. And, and so we are co-managing, actually, those patents with Toyota. Uh, and, you know, we have a, an open dialogue with them uh, around the exploitation of those patents. So, um, so yeah, we, we still have links. Um, next one from Dominic K. What precautions are you taking to secure your technology uh, from either theft or copying by third party countries? Well, you know, we have a, an in-house patent lawyer who um, is on secondment to us from uh, a large patent firm and uh, you know her job is to uh, to secure our patents so to 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 harvest the ideas from uh, the technical team and and to file patents on our behalf but also actually to prosecute them and to monitor uh, other patents around the world to ensure that we've got freedom to operate and you know, if we saw a product that was out there that looked like it infringed uh, one of our patents, then of course we would uh, make that party aware of the case uh, and take steps to uh, to protect our IP. Um, uh, another one from Brian E here it says, "How successful has the lead partner framework been in identifying partners?" Yeah, so you know, for Stereax, we've got a, a very healthy portfolio of around sixteen customers that we are feeding uh, with devices from our pilot line. Um, so we feel that that's given us a lot of validation and comfort around uh, the the, uh, the um, commercial demand for the cells. Uh, that we will produce on that, that Stereax manufacturing line. Um, and also, you know, for Goliath, well, we've, uh, of course, engaged with those automotive partners that we consider really to be lead partners as part of that work. Um, and then, you know, we've got similar relationships in domestic appliances. Um, next one from Jonathan H. Steve, do you want to take this question about uh, our change in strategy, uh, RE, the, uh, the FAB strategy for Stereox? Yeah, so um, there's a number of factors at play uh, in the decision that we made to um, manufacture Stereox batteries in-house. Um, one of them was the, the impact of COVID and travel restrictions. Uh, we were talking to uh, fab facilities around the world um, prior to the epidemic outbreak. Um, but it's meant that uh, if we want to actually physically go and see them during this period, we'd have had to do uh, effectively a month's quarantine, two weeks on the way out and, and two weeks on the way back. Uh, and that's certainly something we couldn't uh, countenance. Um, and the other was when we got down into the detail of detailed negotiations and we're talking about the, the relative costs of um, installing our equipment in their facility and, and paying them for installing them, as well as the margin that they'd be looking to uh, get from us, it became a, uh, it wasn't the capital right option that uh, we'd hoped it would be, and it was actually more um, beneficial to um, manage the process in-house. So next question from Eric C. Uh, could you talk about your patents that could possibly be used by Honda or Toyota? Is there a chance of revenue to come from them? So uh, actually, uh, Honda don't have any um, license from us uh, to use our IP, and actually we don't have any jointly held IP with Honda. Uh, Toyota is, is the partner that we've got some jointly held patents. The agreement that we've got is that both parties are free to use that IP uh, for their own purposes. So there is uh, no expectation of revenue from Toyota for using those. Christopher M says, can you quantify the relative improvements of Goliath pouch performance over the past 12 months? Well, you know, the uh, that's been tracked very closely. Um, you know, we, we update our board regularly 
uh, about those um, improvements and actually um, <laughs> we have been plotting those improvements on a log scale until recently so um, uh, that means we have seen orders of magnitude improvement in the capacity and, and power density of those pouch cells uh, that uh, degree of improvement is is starting to tail off we now plot uh, improvements more recently on a linear scale um, but you know we're starting to see uh, you know very uh, important performance gains that uh, are reassuring us that we're going to have uh, a viable product uh, in the foreseeable future um, so Edward H asked a question similar to the one I've just answered on Toyota. Um, uh, Marius R says, when do you think Goliath will be production ready? So, um, you know, we, we've talked about getting up to five megawatt hours per week by 2024 in uh, the BIC. And that's really when, um, you know, the, the commercial markets are addressed so it's uh, it's that year onwards uh john s says in consumer product area no mention of mobile phones any plans in that area so we don't actually have any collaborations with mobile phone manufacturers and uh, actually that that market is quite cost competitive um and that's not ideal for the launch of a technology you know, we're, we're trying to choose markets where uh, there is less price sensitivity um, and, and frankly, probably slightly smaller volumes. So, you know, we're, we're likely to put it into other consumer electronics before it goes into mobile phones. So another question from JB. Uh, given the volume of shares which are traded on a daily basis on the NASDAQ bulletin board on the OTC basis, and the level of US investor interest in green tech. Will the board consider listing on NASDAQ once Fab One is fully commissioned? Um, I suppose Fab One relates to Stereax, uh, and actually a lot of the US retail uh, investor interest is around the, the Goliath program and the, the automotive batteries. So I, I think the, the trigger uh, to review whether a NASDAQ listing would be um, appropriate would be when we've got performance data and further um, progress, technical progress on our Goliath program. Okay, so I'm going to move on a bit now and go down um, to Graham, just to just to cut yeah. in, just give you a few seconds, just to uh, carry on reviewing. Obviously, um, I'm just mindful of of your time. Um, feel free to take as long as you need to to drift through these questions. Some are, uh, I think, you have touched on in previous questions, and of course, if we don't get round to them during the meeting, there's always the option for you to um, address them post the meeting as well, and investors will be notified uh, when they're ready for to be reviewed. So, um, perhaps feel free to scroll through and um, take ones where it's appropriate. Um, I think I'll answer another couple before we wrap up because um, I can see there's, there's still a lot of interest, but we will uh, undertake to, to answer all of the questions that have come in um, and, uh, and deal with those. Um, I think the one I'll take now is from Andrew A, who uh, asks, have you considered incorporating graphene in your solid state batteries to improve their performance? So uh, actually, that's not one of the additives that we have selected, uh, largely because, uh, in fact, we have done some proof of concept work, but we find that uh, graphene, because it's a 2D material, doesn't survive some of the processing that we put our batteries through. Um, so uh, it, it isn't uh, ideal for us in that regard. Um, and then from yeah let me just select one more that's a bit different
may be um, how will Ilika get paid for its three Goliath collaborations and will it be via license fees for Ilika patented IP? Yeah, so, um, so at the minute we are getting those uh, collaborations supported by um, the, the Faraday battery challenge. So uh, actually that's on a 70-30 basis. So that means that for every ten pounds that we spend on those programs, then we get uh, seven pounds back, um, and we retain all of the IP uh, that is generated, all of the know-how that's generated by ourselves in those programs. And indeed, if um, somebody wanted to take a license to it, um, then that would be on commercial terms. Although. Um, you know, our, our business model is actually to incorporate that IP into our batteries and then to sell the batteries uh, that we manufacture on the basis of the know-how that we've accumulated. That's so, thank you. Thank you. Well, Graham, thank, thank you very much indeed for taking uh, such a thorough approach to the Q&A. And thank you to all the investors that have submitted questions, both pre the event and during the event. And as, as, as Graham and, and uh, Steve have said, obviously, we'll review all of these questions. So thank you once again. Um, Graham, perhaps I just hand back to you just for a few final words to, um, to wrap up. And I know that investor feedback is incredibly valuable and important to you. And then I'll direct investors so they can give you uh, their views. Well, you know, it's been absolutely fantastic to see the number of people who've shown interest in our presentation today. It's been a very vibrant Q&A. Uh, many thanks for all of you who've taken the time to submit those questions. Uh, you know, I think we've got a, a very well-informed retail investor following um, increasingly in the US, and I look forward to engaging with all of you uh, going forward in the future and, and many thanks for supporting our efforts here at Ilica. That's brilliant. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. If you access this meeting via our website, then the feedback page will appear. If you access this from the link sent you by email, you'll simply be asked to log in to submit your feedback. And I can't reiterate enough the importance uh, that the company uh, has your views and your expectations. On behalf of the management team of Illico, we would like to thank you very much indeed for attending today's uh, session. Uh, that now concludes the presentation and good afternoon or evening to you all. Thank you once again.